Hello and welcome to the smallholder lameness and infectious foot diseases in sheep talk. The reason that we decided to do this talk this year is because a lack of productivity is a big it has a big impact on your sustainability. And I know as things are getting a little bit more mild and a little bit more wet in some parts of the country, we are also seeing anecdotally a rise in the number of people who are seeing foot disease in their sheep. Now, do be warned, this particular talk does come with some fairly graphic pictures. So if you are squeamish about pictures of diseases, then please be aware. So. When you're looking at a foot, uh, for example, um, when you're examining perhaps a top that you want to buy or you're examining a group of sheep that you're thinking about buying in, you want to know what a normal foot looks like. You want nice, clean, dry skin in between the toes. You want nice, flat soles on the bottom and walls that seem to be well attached to the sole. As you can see there on the top left hand side, we have a diagram of what an, a healthy sheep foot should look like. And then underneath, we have an example of what you sometimes see with cases of foot disease, such as foot rot. So with foot rot, for example, you will see broken skin or very red um, or weeping skin in between the toes. You may see jagged walls, which do not meet the soles particularly well. And you may sometimes see sloughing off of the hoof wall or the hoof sole. In the top middle there, you can see that somebody's paired one of the toes into a normal shape, whereas the other toe there is just a bit overgrown. And that gives you an idea of, of some of the differences that you can see with overgrown horn as well. And on the right there, we have a couple of pictures of sheep that are demonstrating obvious lameness. Of course, not having a foot on the ground is an obvious sign of lameness. However, if you are just temporarily uh, looking at the sheep as you pass, you may not notice because some sheep will naturally kneel to graze sometimes. You may not necessarily notice if some sheep are doing it far more often and for longer periods, which is a sign that there may be a lameness in the front limb. So your normal foot, there's various structures in which disease can affect. At the top, there is the coronary band, which is the junction between the skin and the horn of the hoof. And then you have your wall coming down to the ground. You have your sole coming back towards the heel. And you can have some fat pads there called digital cushions. And of course, in between the, joint, eh, the bones of the foot, you have the joints as well. And all those areas can be involved in some types of disease. As you can imagine, because it is encapsulated in that horn hoof, an infection in the foot can really, really throb. There's nowhere for the swelling to go. Um, it's very restricted. And if you have had an infection under the fingernail or toenail yourself, you'll know that it can be surprisingly painful compared to, to the severity of the actual infection. So a lame sheep is one that's not able to fully wear, bear weight on one or more legs. That's the definition. And when I say fully, that means if it, if it is putting it down, but it is limping or nodding a little bit on that, that is still a lameness. And it can go all the way through to not putting the foot down at all. No matter whether it is a bit of a limp or a nod right the way through to putting the foot down, it is usually a sheep in pain. Occasionally, there are such things as non-painful mechanical lamenesses. However, these are not common. So the most important thing really is that sometimes a bit of lameness in sheep has become normalized just because it's so common. Um, people don't always equate it immediately to a painful condition in the same way that they instantly would if it was perhaps themselves or their dog or their cat. Um, so we do want to, to, to just reinforce that connection there. The vast majority of lamenesses are due to foot problems. I have put a little caveat in there because, for example, we do see in pet sheep um, or perhaps really, really overly conditioned sheep, um, we see more likely um, 
it's more likely for the sheep to be older if it's a pet. So, for example, commercial sheep might not necessarily uh, have a long lifespan compared to a pet sheep that would definitely still be kept and, and treated. Um, and also sometimes if pet sheep are not productive, if they're not producing lambs, if they're not producing milk and so on, you can get pet sheep that are really quite overweight. And those can sometimes predispose the sheep to arthritis. So we do take into account that obviously there's different situations for different people's sheep. Um, but overall, in sheep, the vast majority of the lameness cases are due to food problems. These are some diagrams, uh, some pictures showing foot rot. So from the left, we have the signs starting in the interdigital skin there. It's obviously reddened. Um, you would possibly find it was a bit smelly. You would find that um, it was tender. And, uh, and you would start to find that those um, infected bits are starting to creep down, perhaps even under the, the wall of the hoof on either side of that interdigital space. And then as we go along the row, you can see that actually the lesions are gaining in severity. They are starting to underrun the horn on either side. And then by the time you get to the right hand side, you obviously have a really quite severe foot rot where um, we have the interdigital space is affected, but also we can start to see that the soles and, uh, and the walls of the hoof on the inner sides have also begun to be affected. That can be a very difficult situation to remedy. So if you can, you really do want to nip it right in the bud. And as I say, if you do equate the lesions that you're seeing in sheep to very similar lesions that you might see on ourselves, you're, you are talking a fairly serious and painful injury here. Consequences for the sheep and holding of having a lot of lame sheep well, they're going to move around less degrees. They will lose weight because of that. They'll, if they're breeding ewes, they'll be producing fewer lambs for you. There will be a higher incidence of twin lamb disease, which is when sheep get very ill in the late stages of pregnancy through not being able to take enough energy in. They will produce less milk. So, for example, it might only be a little bit of uh, less milk than you were expecting or the lambs are just not growing a little bit, um, a little bit uh, less well than you were expecting, for example. But all of this mounts up into lost productivity for the same or greater amount of emissions. So from a sustainability point of view, it's really not good. And then, of course, from a welfare point of view, it's really uh, not good at all. Rams that are affected sire fewer lambs. And you're also going to find that you are going to use more antibiotics. And obviously, in uh, Scottish farming and in UK farming, which does include uh, crofting and smallholding as well, we are trying to reduce the use of antibiotics. We're trying not to rely on them in situations where we could do the job just as well without them, because they are, in some cases, the same as, or in some cases, related to the sort of antibiotics that we would get for illnesses ourselves. And you've probably heard quite a bit about antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, so we, we are trying to preserve our antibiotics um, so that they remain useful and we don't expose them to all these bugs that can develop antibiotic resistance and become super bugs. And of course, antibiotics are extremely important when you have something that the best course of treatment and the fastest course of treatment is going to be antibiotics, they are very, very important to use when they're needed. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the animals don't get sick in the first place so that then you're not just relying on antibiotics to save the day. And we're trying to prevent that, which is good for welfare to start with um, and also, as I say, good for sustainability. Constant foot disease can mean that some sheep are also culled early, but then on top of that, you have issues over fitness to travel. You can't just load them in the lorry and say, right, these guys, they're no good to me anymore. I'll take them to the abattoir, because when they get out at the other end and they're hopping, the vet at the abattoir is going to come over and say, look, those sheep were not fit to travel. 
it isn't legal to transport animals that are not fully weight bearing on all four limbs. Um, so if you are thinking about taking them anywhere, you really do need to speak to your vet. So lame sheep is a very unproductive sheep. Factors that affect how much foot disease you have or whether or not you're likely to see foot disease includes the environment outside, of course, because weather can can sometimes contribute. Warm, wet weather is, is never very good um, for a lot of things, but particularly foot disease. The inside environment, if you do have housing, um, so that would be your bedding and, and your area around your troughs and so on. Sheep pens, if you're running them through sheep pens, the type of ground in there uh, could well contribute to whether or not you see issues. Good prevention regime. So if you have a good way of preventing buying in disease by accident, for instance, quarantine facilities or quarantine times, um, quarantine paddocks, that kind of thing, um, if you are able to facilitate those, then that's quite a good prevention regime. And then if you do run into problems, having a good treatment regime. And that does include diagnosis as well. Bacteria like warm, damp conditions. And as we've said, although Scottish summers are not always particularly warm, um, they are mild, they are damp, and that is condition that can facilitate the uh, the lifespan of bacteria off their their uh, preferred animal. Um, it can facilitate the the bacteria's survival in the environment. And, uh, and the growth as well of bacteria. And also, if you've got skin in contact with moist conditions all the time, as we know ourselves, that can really affect the skin's uh, ability to be a barrier to bacteria. Damp straw bedding is another nice warm, damp condition. And muddy gateways as well. You'll see them sometimes churned up. And around troughs. If you don't move your food and water troughs um, around, and of course, that's not always suitable for everyone. Some uh, parts of the infrastructure will be fixed in some fields. Um, then you can sometimes find that the ground gets all poached and churned up around them. You can buy foot disease in. Foot rot bacteria do become inactive after 10 days on pasture. So that's one of the many reasons that we say it's worth thinking about quarantining any new arrivals. And then if you can utilise fresh pasture for those animals after treatment, that's sometimes a good idea as well. You will learn more about suitability of quarantine in talks about, for example, worming um, or infectious diseases. And sometimes there are different considerations for each different type of parasite or disease. Um, but just to keep it in your mind in general, the quarantine facilities, if you can have them, because obviously we know that smallholders are quite often short on space, but if you can have them, they are good things to have. There are also some other causes of lameness for which the organisms, we don't know enough about them to know how long they can persist in the environment. Inside, things that can make think that, uh, life a little bit worse, uh, wet and mild weather, Fairly acidic or low pH areas of soil, wet areas such as muddy gateways. So, for example, you may see some people utilise lime, wood chip, or sand and gravel just in that little problematic space in their gateway um, to try and reduce problems. Whether or not your soil drains well, the stocking rate, so how many animals you have in there. And your troughs and buckets, how likely or not they are to leak and whether or not they're movable so that the area around them doesn't get churned up. Inside, again, you're thinking about your stocking density. How many sheep do you have per metre squared or per, um, per pen? Your bedding, is that good quality? Is it a little bit damp? Is it a little bit mouldy? And do you have plenty of it? Drainage around the trough areas and racks is important inside as well. The ventilation can make a difference too, because if there's good ventilation, then even though the top layer of bedding can sometimes get a bit dampened, it should 
help to dry out again. Whereas if you've got a really badly ventilated, muggy, foggy um, shed, then that increases the moisture in the environment and makes things a little bit worse. And the type of flooring as well, is it something that's drainable? Is it something that's easily cleaned um, and mucked out? All these things can, can contribute. With sheet pens, the surface construction material can help you or hinder you. The site and drainage is something that you can sometimes change. So if you can't have one of the, the big fancy concrete um, sort of sheet pens, that's that, you know, we do understand that different holdings are at different points in their journeys. Some of them have been derelict and you're fixing them up. Some of them have never really been a holding before. Some of them are in good shape, but perhaps just need a bit of a need a bit of redesigning to fit your needs. There's always the ideal world situation, which we can tell you plenty about to see if any of those things fit the way that you're wanting to build. And then, of course, there is the real world situation, which sometimes means cherry picking various different aspects of what's ideal just to fit into your management. Um, because not all of it's possible at the moment. So, for example, if you do have a, a nicely constructed uh, sheet pen, but now it is right up against the shed where there's a huge amount of water runoff from the roof into that pen area, that can make things worse. And perhaps having the same type of pen, but just moved slightly elsewhere, uh, can can save you a lot of bother. Some people are lucky enough to have covered over pens. If you can make a separate route in and out of your handling pen, that is a really good thing um, if you are treating for feet, because it means that once they have had the treatment put on, they're not just running back through the same mud and bacteria that they came in with. And your foot bath design can help as well. Depending on what formulation you're using, you could find that you are needing to um, keep them standing for some time in the foot bath. And for some foot bath material, it becomes inactivated if there's too much pollution in it, if there's too much mud, if there's too much poo, all the rest of it. Um, so some people find that it's easier to put just a cold water foot bath before the chemical foot bath so that the, the shock of trotting into the cold water makes sheep um, do a poo before they get into the, the foot bath. And also, of course, it helps to wash off the mud before they go into the chemical foot bath as well. So that's a little trick that can sometimes help. And always one of the most important things that's going to affect whether or not you have a huge amount of bother with foot disease is going to be the number of sheep that do have foot disease on your holding. So if you do buy in just one or two and you think I'm going to fix them up, you get them for cheap. I have seen this happen. And um, so, you know, it is something that I've seen smallholders do is maybe get a nice quality top uh, for a lot cheaper just because he's, he's started to have a bit of bother with his feet. And they buy it in and all of a sudden they realise that some of their ewes have now got foot problems as well. That kind of thing. Um, it is it is a big contributor. So here's your ideal sheep pen. Uh, obviously nice flat concrete floor, it's not anywhere near that's going to constantly get water runoff. I doubt an awful lot of you will have one of these. It's great to have and think about um, if you can. But yeah, we'll, we'll go through the various sort of types of sheep pens. And, and at the end of the day, we're, we're only able to work with the situations that we have. And there are various things that you can do to make life a bit easier. So here we have a very muddy pen. However, a lot of it seems to be made of hurdles. So there's the possibility that if you see that kind of setup, it might be quite a tour to move it. However, especially if some of the fencing is getting to the point that it needs replaced already anyway, you might actually think that there's a possibility to move it to a slightly more well-drained site, or there might be a possibility to add some material there to make it a bit less damp. And then we've got, obviously, your your worst nightmare, really, 
again, if you can add some material there to make it a bit less damp, or if you can check what's happening with the drainage. Um, for example, if you find that there are some drain outlets that are very obviously blocked and that kind of thing um, right by the, the pen. Um, and again, you could think about potentially resighting as well if there's a, an area that might be a bit less prone to that. And as I say, if you do have a situation where you think you really just cannot get away from a worse um, type of sheet pen, then is there the possibility that you could at least make it a one route in, one route out pen? Is it a case of adding an extra foot bath to your foot bath part of the run so that the sheep get their feet washed before they end up in the chemical? That kind of thing. Gates can sometimes be quite focused areas of just a bit of poaching. You might find that it's fine on either side, but that lovely warm mud uh, in the middle there if you can just dry that up with a bit of a substrate, or maybe if you're in a particularly acid area, a wee bit of lime, something like that. Um, I've seen people use sand, gravel, chips, um, wood chips, that kind of thing. With your quarantine, ideally you're isolating bought-in sheep, or if you've got sheep returning for a show, that's not just a foot thing, um, that is just in general for infectious disease. So for that, ideally 28 days if possible. If you do see any lameness or foot lesions in that time, you want to treat them. Then if you've treated them and they're recovered, you can run them through a foot bath and you can return them to flock at the end of quarantine. If they're not recovered, you're going to have to check that you've got the right diagnosis, so that you're going to have to check that you have assumed um, that it's foot rot or scald or whatever and have been correct. And then you're going to have to retreat. Obviously, if you were incorrect, then you're going to have to tailor the treatment to take that into account, the, the new diagnosis. Foot bathing ideals would be clean feet, correct amount of time in the bath, the correct concentration for the chemical, good dry standing after they've come out of the foot bath. I know that's not going to be possible for everybody. We just like to let you know what the, the ideal situation would be, just in case it's something you can incorporate. And then turning into a clean field rather than the field that's full of the foot rot bacteria from before. You'll find that there's quite a lot of different chemicals available. There's formalin, and it's important to know you need to keep that as clean as possible because it is quite inactivated by organic materials, so any mud or poo. It's a slow walk through. Zinc sulfate for scald, you walk through. For foot rot, you may have to stand for 30 minutes. And we'll talk to you about what scald and foot rot are. Adding a little bit of washing up liquid can increase the penetration of that chemical. And it's not so deactivated by organic material mud and things getting into it. So for example, you might find that due to your setup, you prefer one chemical over another. Copper sulfate is maybe not ideal for sheep, um, just because if they did accidentally drink a bit of it, uh, they, they can get copper toxicity, um, but it is still used. Antibiotics are only used for treating outbreaks of contagious ovine digital dermatitis. They're only from prescription, and you usually have to stand them in for quite a while, unless you've got a specially made up spray. So I'll talk to you about what CODD is as well. And always, always follow your vet instructions. Those are the instructions that you're likely to see on the packets. But if your vet has different instructions, then of course you would follow them. So common causes of lameness go from scald, foot rot, CODD, as we've just talked about, and then shelly hoof, toe fibromas, foot abscesses, which can also run up to the joints, and something called strawberry foot rot. So we'll just take you through those very quickly and uh, so that you have a rough idea what you might be looking at if ever any problems arise. Scald is just when the area between the toes is moist and red and painful, it's a precursor to foot rot. 
and it can sometimes arise if the sheep have been in quite wet conditions for a while, especially if there's rough plants in the field at the same time. So if you have a very wet summer and on top of that, you've got quite a lot of thistles or whatever in your field that could be scratching the areas in between the toes, then you'll sometimes get a wee outbreak of scald. If you can nip this right in the bud, it's one of the easier things to, to fix. And it is worth nipping it in the bud just because otherwise it could turn into foot rot, which is much harder at times to treat. There are bacteria involved in that. It is the trauma to the, the skin, as we talked about, the constant wetting and then the scratching allows the bacteria to get in. If you do have an annual problem every year, then you can think about running sheep through your foot bath a couple of weeks before the expected outbreak. Or sometimes if you don't have that many sheep or if you've only ever got a couple that are affected, you can apply antibiotic spray to affected sheep. Foot rot, we've talked about being quite a lot worse. It is can can develop from scald because similar types of bacteria are involved, although there's usually some extra bacteria that come along with foot rot. It can be caused by one or two bacteria working together. So those are the Latin names there, Dicylobacter nodosus or Fusobacterium. It causes underrunning and separation of the sole and the hoof wall. So you can imagine that that's equivalent to us sloughing a nail. It usually has quite a characteristic stinky smell. So if you have smelled foot rot before, usually you can recognize it. And it can persist via chronic carrier sheep. So this is why we're checking the feet when we're buying sheep as much as possible. It's why we're uh, hopefully trying to quarantine sheep to see if they're about to develop some kind of disease because you can really buy this in. Most sheep don't produce a natural antibody response, so they don't become naturally immune. So somebody who says to you that they've had foot rot before, but they're probably immune now, that's, that's not really the case. It can vary in severity. So you might find some people that say, ah, I did have a bit of bother with foot rot, but it was no bother to get rid of. And you might see people think that perhaps it's not as serious. Well, it can vary in severity depending on the strain of bacteria you end up with. Often introduced by purchased sheep, certain breeds are more susceptible particularly very high producing breeds and things like that, um, you're putting a bit more strain on their bodies, for example, so they can sometimes be a bit more prone to, to getting foot problems. Whereas I'm sure you've had experience with these light, um, sort of evolved to live in the mountains, hard footed little breeds, um, they, they tend to be a little bit less likely to end up with foot problems. Bacteria, as we've said, they don't like high pH, they like acid conditions, so you can think about using a bit of lime in gateways and so on. And bacteria can live on the pasture for up to 10 days. We don't actually know how long the bacteria can survive in warm, wet bedding. So if you are lucky enough to be able to house your sheep um, when you need to, then that is something to take into consideration. This is the most important thing because if you are learning from farmers or if you have um, family who have previously kept sheep, it used to be the case that with foot rot, people used to go really quite aggressively in with the trimming. The, the idea, the logic behind it was to trim away of as, as much of the bad stuff as you possibly could. Now, there's been research in the last decade or so that shows that that actually can make things worse. The new research says, if you've got sheep there with foot rot, you do not trim. You're going to treat the, foot, the sheep that have the foot rot. You're going to put the rest of the flock through a foot bath. You might want to think about vaccination with foot backs. Um, that can involve two doses given a month or six weeks apart, but it is something you would have to discuss with your vet. And the lame sheep, the ones that are affected with foot rot, you don't trim them, you inject them with long-acting antibiotic. And then you reassess them in seven to 10 days. If you need to repeat the process and inject them with a long-acting antibiotic again, you can do that. You want to do that if they're showing some signs of improvement, but they're not quite there yet. If they're not improving, 
then you want to have a think about your diagnosis and the possibility that it could be something else. And this is one of the things that it could be. This contagious ovine di digital dermatitis, it can be even more severe than foot rot. Characteristically, it can start rather than in between the toes, which the scald and the foot rot tends to do. Characteristically, it can start from the coronary band. So that's the area, the junction between the skin and the, the hoof. It can very quickly progress into something that makes their hooves start to slough, and it is really quite severe. It's thought to be caused by a bacteria as well, but also another little type of organism called a spirochete. You can get the loss of the, the whole claw, which is, is what we call one side of the hoof, um, one toe of the hoof. We don't know how long these little spirochetes will survive on pasture, I'm afraid. And it is often confused with foot rot. So if you have treated for foot rot and nothing seems to have happened after seven days or it's got worse, then this is definitely one of the things that we'd be thinking potentially it could be. You don't trim these guys either. You're probably going to have to run them through an antibiotic foot bath, which is going to need you to speak to your vet because it needs a prescription. Or they might ask you to spray individual feet with a specially made up type of hand spray of antibiotic. This is not your blue spray um, type antibiotic. This will be something different and uh, it'll need specially made up. For the sheep that do have the lameness, you're going to inject them with antibiotic. If you've, particularly if you've already tried the foot rot antibiotic that is your current go-to and it hasn't worked, then you're really going to have to think about your antibiotic choice. So you, it is a good idea just to give your vet a phone. You can explain exactly what's been going on and get some advice there. And you're going to have to think about your meat withdrawal as well, um, which is the amount of time that you have to leave after you've given an animal medication before it's legal for them to, to get sent to the abattoir. You're going to reassess them in seven to 10 days after their treatment, and you may have to repeat the treatment. You may have to give them the antibiotic again. Foot and toe abscesses can make sheep very lame, but when you look at them, you can see that there's just one area that's very swollen or it's just started draining pus. It usually does burst out. Um, it's usually caused by bacteria tracking up, perhaps through a track in the sole. The bacteria's go in and it's tracked up underneath the hoof and then it's burst out the top. It's quite rare with good feet. So if you are um, making sure that your sheep have good feet, you hopefully shouldn't see it terribly often. And again, treatment is quite often by antibiotic, but you can get away with a little bit of very careful pairing just to help widen the holes that the pus is already draining from, for example. That can sometimes help. This is actually caused by over pairing, and that's a little bit of proud flesh that sticks out from an area that has been over paired, and it stops the hoof closing over on top of it again. It can be treated, but it should only be treated by a vet, and it can be quite costly to do so. So the best option is prevention, and by prevention we mean not overpairing in the first place. Shelly hoof is what occurs when an area of wall detaches from the underlying surface, and then you end up with a pocket forming under the detached wall. So what we've got here is if you look between the toes, you won't find stinky, horrible, purulent skin. If you look down the sides of the hoof, you won't um, come across inflamed, uh, detaching, horrible hoof walls. What you do have is a fairly sort of healthy looking foot, but just with an extra flappy bit of horn that is causing a bit of a pocket. You can get that a wee bit more often if your sheep have a nutritional deficiency, but it also actually has a genetic component. They're not infectious, so if you are seeing quite a lot of them, you might want to think about whether or not that runs in family lines or whether or not you've got a slightly unusual diet on the go. And treatment is careful trimming just of the dead horn only. So you only trim away just the extra flappy bits that are hanging loose there. And the reason for that is to get rid of the pocket. Otherwise, lots of little sharp stones can get stuffed up in there with mud and it can really start to hurt. 
strawberry fruit what we want you to recognize because it is orf virus so if your lambs get scabby lips or you've seen scabby uh, lesions or ulcers in their lips or tongue um if you are aware that you've got a bit of orf firstly be very aware that you can catch it it can be quite a painful condition in humans and there's not a cure so you just have to have it for a while until it eventually cures itself and um, i have met plenty of farmers and smallholders that have managed to get orf if you have any underlying serious health conditions it can make the sores a bit harder to get rid of so always wear gloves if you think your sheep have got scabby lips around um classic looking orf lesions make sure you keep your gloves on and if you see a strawberry foot rot like this again make sure you wear your your gloves and you can see why it's got the name it's just a big swollen proliferative lesion um which is is a mixture of virus and bacteria that have just um caused a, a strawberry like lump you're probably going to need long acting antibiotics and it might need more than one dose it can be quite slow to resolve as you could probably imagine with a big lump like that do watch out for flies um orf is a little bit more obvious and prevalent in younger lambs as you've probably seen yourselves if you if you've had it on farm so that means that it's around in the spring and then of course after spring comes the, the fly season and um, so it's just at the right time of year that uh, this could really attract the flies and cause huge problems so you do want to have to think about that so a bit quick summary of lame sheep how to proceed separate them from non-lame sheep if you can treat them with a long acting antibiotic most likely um, if you think you've got an infectious foot disease obviously if it's the shelly hoof or some of the things that that aren't infectious that's fine you can just deal with that but if it does look like it's an infectious foot disease treatment for the long acting, long acting antibiotic veterinary advice is always good to take i think people don't make use of veterinary advice even over the phone as often as would be really beneficial because you do want to nip these things in the bud check the foot pair it only if there's shelly hoof or an obvious abscess not if there's foot rot skull or codd check it a week later after you've either paired it or if you've given the long acting long acting antibiotic just to check that everything's fine if it's only been shelly hoof um, then it's fine to put them obviously back with all the other sheep anyway because that's just a bit of extra flappy horn um, you have nothing to worry about there um, if it is something that's likely to be infectious then of course you want to keep them separate if you can if they're completely sound after a week you just run them through the foot bath and return them to the flock if they're not sound after a week you're probably going to have to retreat and by that i mean the infectious causes that have had the long acting antibiotic reevaluate your diagnosis because if they're not sound have they at least got a bit better is there some response to treatment there or do you really need to think about whether you've given the wrong treatment and got the wrong diagnosis in the first place recheck them again a week later and if they're then sound they can go through the foot bath and return to the flock but i'm afraid if you've had two courses of treatments and there's no recovery and you know you've got your diagnosis right perhaps you've already um, been in, in constant contact with your vet you are going to have to reevaluate your diagnosis again but if you're pretty sure you've got the right thing and it's just too far gone for treatment to have done much for you you might have to consider culling them obviously nobody ever wants to do that um, but it's something from a welfare point of view that you may have to have in the back of your mind if the alternative is having a really sore lame sheep uh, hopping about your premises which is a welfare issue when you're separating the original lame sheep consider foot bathing the known ones for prevention so for example if they're not affected yet it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be especially if the number of lame ones appears to be increasing as time goes by and again the foot bath can be replaced a couple of weeks later if necessary you've probably heard of the foot back vax we mentioned it a little bit ago as well that's a vaccine against foot rot you are going to have to speak to your vet if you think that that is a potential consideration that you might want to go over 
It can be used to prevent and it can actually be useful during a big outbreak. So don't discount it completely if you've already got a big outbreak on the go and think, right, vaccination, no use uh, while we've got an outbreak on the go. Um, it is worth speaking to your vet to find out what they think, because sometimes within an outbreak, it can reduce the transmission of the disease between sheep to sheep and it can speed up the healing as well. The only problem with foot vax is that it's only effective for four to six months. So that's worth taking into account because by the time you've got it in, into your head to speak to the vet, it might not be the right time of year for that and this year's uh, slot might have gone. So you are going to have to plan and target its use. If you gave it too early, then it might well have worn off by the time that you're actually needing it to prevent the foot disease. It can be given as a preventative before the main risk period. And as I say, you're going to have to think about preparing um, the good few weeks before your main risk period. So again, you want to get in there and talk to the vet before it naturally comes uh, up as, as part of your day to day. And when you are using it as a potential treatment, you always have to use it alongside the other strategies. It's not a replacement for antibiotic use or foot bathing. They all have to be used together. So remember, you may have to call sheep that are not improving. And if that is not as good of a driver towards nipping something in the bud early, then I don't know what is. Because at the end of the day, if you can get in and nip things in the bud early, you're hopefully not going to find yourself with something that's so far gone that you need to make that type of decision. Do be aware that foot vax vaccinated sheep can have a contraindication with certain wormers, and that can last for life. So if you've bought in sheep and the person you're buying from happens to tell you, well, the bean foot backs vaccinated, do discuss that with the vet if you've not come across that before, because they will warn you away from administering certain wormers, which can cause really quite a nasty reaction sometimes. And if you want to get all of that information in a nice, short, handy format that's really uh, suited to being stuck up on your shed wall, you can follow the link in faz.scot to download the five-point plan for tackling lameness in sheep. This is research that has come from a number of different partners over a long time. And together, they have on AHDB, they have um, published a, a five-point plan for tackling lameness, which goes over the various points that we've made. It comes as a poster like this. As you can see, it'll tell you all about the, the um, rationale behind the framework. It's got a calendar there to remind you at what different times of year you might see particular problems or you should be dealing with certain problems. And it also has a decision tree for when you do see a lame sheep, which has a lot of those pictures on as well. If you do find that particular family lines in your sheep seem to constantly give you bother with feet, whether that's needing to pair back the, the flappy horn on shelly hoof right the way through to constantly getting foot rot every year when the weather turns damp, then you might want to think about the fact that Either you've maybe got a particular breed predisposition if you've got a mixed flock, or if they are all the same, you might perhaps have a family predisposition. So you have a wee think about exactly which offspring are from those sheep and see if actually there's a pattern there to who has good feet and who has bad. Overall, if you have success, you should have healthy, productive sheep. A lot of smallholders that I know um, I will say we've never really had foot problems before. And that is absolutely true for an awful lot of people right up until they do. And some people, of course, are going to be lucky and are, are perhaps have good preventative measures in place as well. It's certainly not always luck. Sometimes it's just good preparation and they may never see uh, particularly bad foot problems. But it's definitely worth knowing early on exactly how you're going to deal with it if you do. Thank you very much for your time. This presentation was funded by the Scottish Government as part of its Public Good Veterinary Advisory Services. As with all of our talks, you can send us questions through the festival organisers and we will do our best to get back to you.